Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release, unearthing video game relics that were once lost, thought, once lost or thought forgotten. We're back in 1982, May 1982, and we're going to play the last game we played, Labyrinth, on the Atari Home Computer by Broderbud. Let's hear that ditty one more time. We don't get a lot of music in 1982, and that is a jam. So after Labyrinth, let's see where our next game is, is going to take us. One. These families are learning about home computers. The family with Our next game is on the Commodore VIC-20, and this is Laser Blast. That's right, Laser Blast. If you're a fan of Atari and Activision, it might sound familiar. One of the ones programmed by David Crane. But here is on the Commodore VIC-20. We have no box for this one, just a screenshot, so let's pop in and play Laser Blast. The beginning of May 1982 by Gunter Kuch by HES, Human Engineer Software, did the publishing on this one. We're ready to go. Oh. I'm going to cheat a little bit because we're not waiting that long. There we go. We're in. Laser Blast, I believe, is the very first time because, I mean, look how this plays. I am a ship at the top of the screen. I can move up, down, left, and right. I'm getting destroyed right now, but you use the Commodore VIC-20 joystick, and you're putting lasers down on the the uh, ships on the end. Okay, well, I guess we'll try again. But this is probably the very first time that an original game for a console has been ported to a computer. This is it. Laser Blast, it doesn't really play the same. Obviously, it's much better on the Atari home computer. It is extremely clunky, but it's the idea that you're the ship at the top. You're firing down with the laser temperature that you have to watch out for. But it is, uh, it's kind of a, a chore to play. Not nearly as good as what we played on the Atari. For one thing, I can't tell if I can dodge the shots by the other ships because they're firing up at me and I don't think there's any way to avoid them. That's it. But it's, it's bizarre that it's the same name as the game by David Crane, and it plays or looks kind of like an homage to it. So it's probably the very first time someone took an original game on a console and then made it into a computer game. Feels like a rush job, though. I mean, look at the movement of my ship. It doesn't feel as smooth, and it doesn't feel like I have a lot of control over the UFO, as if you were playing on the Atari VCS. And right there, I don't know what killed me. Something destroyed me, and I can't even tell what it was. And that's pretty much it for Laser Blast. A uh, very unique curiosity of going from a console to a computer. But the way it plays, it's close to the bad range, um, just because of the, the controls. The uh, look of it obviously makes you think you're playing something like Laser Blast, but uh, hit detection and the way the laser comes down doesn't work so well. I'm going to go, uh, it's a bad title, two stars. Not merely because of the graphics, just because of the controls. And after Laser Blast, let's see where we're going now. Next is on the TRS-80, and this is Laser Defense. Let's see what Laser Defense is all about, starting with the box. We have the front of the box by Med System Software. That's pretty cool. Is it a, a just a kid sitting down in a control center playing with a like a giant Model 1 or Model 3? You only need 16K for this one, but it's meant to be kind of like a command shooter, similar to Missile Command. And you're going to take control of it all. And there's the advertising flyer. Same thing. A kid playing at the control sc screen and have to determine where the missiles are going to come and then deflect them. Love it. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was definitely the poor man's version of Laser Blast. The very poor man's version. I don't know if there's any other versions. Or if we're going to see many console games get turned into computer games, but pretty cool. So the main superstructure of the United States is under attack. You control primary ABL. Target console, your only six laser bases can halt the onslaught of ICBMs, killer pods, and lunar blasters. As wave of wave becomes stronger and longer, your tired fingers itch to activate the ultimate defense, eradication. Fast action arcade game for the TRS-80, we love those. Looks like cassette, it costs 15 bucks. Disc costs 18 bucks back in the day. With an example of the screenshot, we also have the manual for laser defense. Nice. How do we play this? 
Now, <laughs> loading instructions, I usually breeze by. We now know we need to look a little bit at loading instructions just to see if it tells us anything specific. Disk users loaded in, reset, and the program will load automatically. Okay, that's, we are on disk, so it should work that way. So it begins by giving you six cities and four laser satellites. The enemy played by the computer begins with 12 missile silos. Your goal is to destroy the silos while simultaneously defending your city against the ICBMs they launch. You'll have to defend the satellites against particle beam weapons. Sounds like missile command to me. Missiles in flight can only be destroyed while viewing the map of the United States. To do this, position the site of the four arrow keys. Press the space bar and lasers will fire. Okay, probably doesn't use a joystick then. Silos are located in Europe and the Soviet Union map. Yes, the Soviet Union. We must destroy them. Laser energy is shown at the bottom of the screen. Each new wave will replenish the energy. At, also at the bottom, you see the eradicator energy. This is replenished by getting the bonus energy at 10,000 point intervals. Eradicator energy also maintains shields against particle beam weapons. When it's gone, you're vulnerable to satellite destruction. Cool. The particle beam weapon will appear on the Soviet Union screen periodically and fire at your satellites. Okay. Once in a long while, you see a nuclear power plant in East Germany. If you position your site exactly over the center turret and press E, the eradicator will destroy it. You get a 4,000 point bonus. Nice. If your phone rings, press P for pause. <laughs> oh, not in the game. They mean in real life. If your phone rings, you can go press P for pause. They keep doing that. They're really advertising. You can now pause video games. It's the wave of the future, man. It is like war games. We haven't seen that yet. 1983, isn't that when the Matthew Broderick one comes out? It's not out yet, but uh, there's plenty of games like Missile Command where we're going to be doing that. After each game's completed, you get the bonus points awarded for Blazer bases. And there's our controls, arrow keys, space bar, E for Eradicator. You got two different maps, it looks like. And then P to pause the game, but don't hit that break key with our point scores that we need. There we go, yes. So like we saw in the back of the box, the goal is simple, destroy all missile silos intercepting rockets launched toward the US, pulverize the enemy, keep your cities alive, and if you need to activate the, your final defense, use eradication. Let's pop in and play Laser Defense in the beginning of May 1982 by Simon Smith. Way to go, Simon, and Med System Software. Gonna load up Laser Defense. <laughs> There it is. We've heard that public domain song over and over again. Takata and Fuge by Bach. I don't think that song's ever going to go away. Nice intro. I'm going to try the joystick just to see if it does work. Look at this, man. TRS-80 makes some great arcade games. So cool. Got an intro. There's our high scores on the side. And they even give you a heads up right here of the instructions. Nice. Press S to start. We're ready. Let's go. One or two players. If we do two players, it's alternating play. So we got one player booting us up, and then we are in. There's my cursor. Feels really weird to control it with a keyboard, but it does not work correctly with the joystick. It is keyboard only. And there it is. United States got to protect all the cities. We have missiles coming in on the other side of the globe. And then can I go over to that side and destroy them? If I hit one, can I destroy their silos? I can. That's so cool. Okay, so it's like Missile Command. But you got two screens to switch back and forth. So you have to protect the United States while simultaneously blowing up silos over here. And if things get too tight, did something get blown up? I heard a, a splash. Oh, okay, something's hitting us, but if we if it gets too intense, we can push the E button and it causes the eradicator to blow up. There, E. Oh, sweet. So the Eradicator just really, really quick knock, knocks him out. There's no sound for the normal shot, though. Only the Eradicator made a little bleep, and that's all we got for sound. Not that I'm expecting much from the TRS-80 sound-wise, but we've heard this thing talk. And it just seems weird going totally silent. Yes, and the song we heard, the Takata and Fuge, uh, Gyrus. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hear that one for sure. I'm going to go back, and this is a cool idea. Going from one side to the other. And I have no eradicator energy, so now i got to be a little bit more careful. Let's go back. Looks like this one's blowing us up. Oh! Oh, yeah, and laser energy went down, so... Darn, yeah, they gave us game over, but what a cool idea. Go back and forth. <laughs> There's the song again. So it's Missile Command with a different twist or to a different idea to it. And here it is on the TRS-80. We've had no other command shooter like this that does this perspective. 
and goes, has you switch back and forth. So it has a strategy to it. I love that. That's pretty cool. It is controlled only keyboard, though. No joysticks, so you don't have anything cool like a trackball or a paddle control. So for laser defense, e even though keyboard only, it, it was really, really good. Played really well, and it would be a blast to play. Uh, and Missile Command still is really hot right now, so I still could say it's, it's a pretty good title. It's not one of the best games you could play of all the games, but I'm going to go four stars. Laser defense is an excellent title. And as usual, anyone that's here live for the show, throw out those ratings. If you're in 1982 right now, how would you rate these video games? So there's Laser Defense. Let's see where we're going now. Our next game is Mancala for the Atari Home Computer. That's right, Mancala, spelled very weirdly compared to the actual Mancala. Let's take a look at the box for Mancala. There it is. It's from the Atari Program Exchange or APX. Computerized version of the African Stone and Board game. Yes, one in, one or two players. Any other artwork we have for Mancala? Hey, hey! So we flip it over the back of the box. As usual, the APX games on the Atari home computer just look like business software. Not very fancy. Something on the, the TI-99. All right, so just an example of the screenshot. Not anything there, but we do have the manual of how Mancala plays. If you're not familiar, it's the classic stones that you might move around the board and try to get all yours clear away before your opponent. Or capture as many as you can. So there we go, Atari information. There we go, the Stone Age Method Computer Age, Mancala. Ancient African game traditionally played with stones in the ground or hand-carved board is now available on your Atari home computer. Most people have these on their coffee tables. Computer as Mancala remains faithful to the original game's rules and format. And this is not the first time we've seen a Mancala video game. There's a few that were on mainframe that we don't check out mainframe games. But uh, there's um, a couple others, maybe one or two. This is the only one they spelled this way, I'm guessing for marketing. But two players can compete against each other or you can play with another human component. And the joystick works too. Each stone dropped into a bin remains there permanently. Whenever the last stone in a turn lands in the player's home bin, the player takes another turn. The game ends when one player empties all the playing bins in his set, and the holder of more stones is the winner. If you need to brush up on what Mancala is. So there's how you load it. <laughs> Again, we're breezing by the loading screen. If it doesn't work correctly, we'll know for sure. And then our play, how to play Mancala, we'll have options that we push on our Atari computer. Higher levels, one competition. After your set options, you press start to go to the playing field. Yeah, so it, it, they don't have screenshots. The APX ones, look at that. Is, that. is that ASCII they're using to show the playing field? Nice. Choose your stone, start the game, then make your move. If it's all joystick control, it should have a really good interface. I like when you can plug in the Atari VCS joystick and go. So there's the game rules of how it works, counting stones. It's, it, it'd be more if you need to know how to play Mancala. Like what... Um, if you don't know what, what, what Mancala is, this would help show you. But I did want to point this out. At the end of the, of the um, uh, every APX manual, they have a reference sheet to give you quick references to where the buttons are. But they also have every single APX once your review of the game. Because all these were made by people and then submitted to Atari. And the Atari Program Exchange had some real, really bad duds. But then they had some really, really good ones that we're going to see from 1983. And some we've, we've already seen from APX, but it's funny that they say, what do you think of the game? If you have problems, do you like about the problem, what do you don't like? So you're asking, you're answering these questions and then you mail them into Atari to give your opinion on the game, which is kind of cool. All right, let's pop in and play Mancala. In the beginning of May, 1982, by Elizabeth Chase McRae. Way to go, Elizabeth. Published by APX. Is it cool or not? So we got start. Ooh, they got some African drums playing in the background, nice. We got options. Okay, so we got player versus computer level one, two, three, or four, or player versus player. Don't have a guess with me this time, so we're doing player versus comp computer and pushing start. Select the number of stones. So we can start with three stones each one, which is the easier way. We'll do that one. Or if you push option. There you go, and we're in. So it uses the joystick, and this is me moving left and right on my board. And whenever you push the red button, you drop one, two, three stones, and then the computer does its move. One, two, three gets dropped. And there you go. We're playing Mancala. Easy peasy on the computer. So if I want to go the best route, we're going to do this one. I am not a Mancala pro. But every time you get one empty, you get dropped in your bin. Oh, that, that was a poor move. Because every time that you get uh, one wiped out, then you can continue to do move like the computer is doing. Got it. And then do one, two, three, four. 
Yeah, so if you want to play Mancala, this is pretty good. For 1982, that is awesome. Now, it just depends on how how much are you hankering to play a Mancala game. So it's at least average because the interface really, really done well with using the Atari VCS joystick. And I'd even say um, just because of how well it plays and easy easy you can come in and play the game, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's a, a perfectly average game for the, the, the time. Three stars for Mancala. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're next going to the Arcadia 2001. The commercial on the left is the Japanese Bandai Arcadia. And we're going to be checking out Math Logic. Sounds a lot of fun, right, kids? Math Logic is uh, just a, a mastermind variant. That's that's all it is, with a few other uh, options you can play. But here's the box for Math Logic if you were checking out it in uh, North America or Europe. And do we have another artwork for Math Logic? I don't think so. Nope, just the cartridge, and that's it. We do have the manual too. Now, this first was available in North America and then in other regions because the Emerson Arcadia 2001 was all over the world, had lots of different names. You can see here it's saying the MG307. So what is this game? It's got a lot of games. It's got Mindbreaker, it's got Maxit, and it's got Hangman. Hangman? We've been yearning for another Hangman game. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, if you're hankering or not, this, this is what you get from 1982. Test yourself with these three remarkable games, all contained within the same cartridge. Break the mysterious hidden code, test your powers of logical deduction, beat the computer and your opponent by planning strategic moves, check out your word power, find out how you rate. So you gotta use your brain, and your mind, and your head. And there's the three, so it is three games in one, and it is include Hangman, which sounds antiquated. We've seen Hangman on older consoles back in like the 70s. So here it is in 1982. We got another one coming out. <laughs> At least it's not Leonardo da Vinci like it was before. So you plug in the antenna, turn off your console. There it is. Insert that cartridge into your Emerson Arcadia. And then hand controller, game selection, how to play. Now, I'm, I'm actually just going to show kind of what the manual looks like because sadly, this game is... Not found. I could not get a copy to actually pop it and play Math Logic. So we're going to have to give this one a one star. But I mean, you saw what's included in this. We got Hangman, we got a, a Mastermind variant, and then we have a Logic game. So uh, it, I, I wouldn't have given it the best one. But if you got a copy and you can give it to me, we'll re rate it and play again. In the meantime, it gets one star for Math Logic. I had high hopes for this new console. Come on, it's got a controller like in television. <laughs> yes, well, this one, I wouldn't say they were pushing for entertainment. The best edutainment title, I, in my opinion, we've seen so far was Dueling Digits. That was a really fun one. I gave that one four stars for the time. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're back on the Atari home computer, and this is Meltdown. Not to be confused with another Meltdown that we're going to see later, but this one is by APX. So here we go back with Atari Program Exchange again. Let's take a look at the box for Meltdown. Again, just looks like business software. By Steven Romejko. Way to go, Steven. Fill a leaking reactor before it melts. You need 32K for this one. Flip it over in the back, and it doesn't tell you anything about the game because each one of these is made by users for users. There's our five and a quarter floppy disk by APX, and that's it. We do have a manual, though. What is this? What is Meltdown? Tell us, Atari. Tell us. These actual scans are so cool. It's like being there in 1982. If I had it in front of me, I'd give it a I'd give it a whiff, and it'd smell like 1982. Meltdown's a challenging maze chase game. It is actually not a maze chase game at all. You'll see when we boot it up. I don't wonder why they described it that way. You're a night watchman alone in a small town nuclear power plant. You discover a leak in the cooling tower. You're faced with maintaining a safe water level in the water to prevent nuclear disaster. You maintain this level by carrying buckets of water, depositing them onto the top of the tower. Meanwhile, the leak in the tower has caused radioactive water to run off into a nearby reservoir. Use the red joystick button to jump over various species of mice that have been adversely affected by the contaminated water. Years before Homer Simpson worked in a nuclear power plant, now you're going to be doing that. <laughs> Oh, a math Pac-Man game? If you know the name, let me know, because we've either played it or we will be playing it. You score bonus bonus points whenever you successfully jump over mice or dump buckets of water into the tower and earn a super bonus if you refill the tower, repairing the leak. Wow. All right, so we're going to work in a nuclear power plant. Gotcha. 
How do we load it down into memory? If you have cassette or disc, it explains how to load it there. And then they give you a copyright screen. They explain what the select key does. If you do one or two player, it is an alternating player game again. So we can't have two people at once. Option key is just skill level and then start to play. Spacebar pauses the game. Man, they're all over it in 1982. If you, you can pause the action now, it is so cool. And then what high score you have. So once you've gotten all ready, then your man's position at the bottom of the screen, the basement of the two buildings, your bucket's under the faucet to be ready to be filled with water. And then they give you the action display, where the cooling tower is, the sink, stairways, and then they have a makeshift picture of it. You have to tilt your head to the side, but they, they drew a picture of the screen and explain what all the, all the parts are because it's a little more complicated than this and it's not a maze chase game. Maybe they did that because Pac-Man's so popular, but it is not. This one's using the Atari VCS joystick and you can see you have three different things that happen when you go pu pull down on the VCS joystick. So it's a little more complicated than your generic APX title. And this was made by a user too, which is kind of cool. And there's our score system. Jumping over Small or large mice gives us different points and then filling up the nuclear power plant with water or filling the tower gives you lots of points. And then they give you some strategies and hints and tips of how to play. Very nice. Thank you, Atari, for all the help. All we have is an alternate version, so let's pop in that disc and play Meltdown in the beginning of May 1982 by Steven Romejko and APX. There it is, Meltdown. Kind of cool that we get options for the game. So you can do one player or two player, and then level one or two, three, four, and then we'll just start on level one and go. <laughs> That's a very random uh, game to play. Okay, so here I am. Uh oh, the reactor's cracked. Someone get in there. All right, this is me. Wow, it's an actual full sprite of me. So I'm down at the bottom as the orange guy carrying a bucket. And so you got to go over here to the faucet, push down on your VCS joystick. And now I turned blue, which means I got a full bucket. And I have to avoid the mice getting over to the top of the reactor and dump it in. So it is a platformer, the very first platformer done by APX. Someone, someone programmed this. This is incredible. So go over to the side, you want to dump it, go to the top and then push down and then boom, dump it in and then go back and repeat ad nauseum. So it's uh, essentially like a Donkey Kong style game. You have an objective to get to one place to the other. And we got constant tunes in the background. Fill up my bucket, turn blue and then get away <laughs> from the mice, make sure they don't touch me. We got a full-on sprite, though, larger than uh, the Brave Carpenter from Donkey Kong. I don't think they've called him Mario yet. All right, doing it. Getting back there. We got some really fast radioactive mice to dodge, though. This game feels like it's halfway between an Atari VCS game and an Atari computer game. What we're doing in the game, though, is pretty cool. That we have, look at that, I have the freedom also to go over here. Oh, there's no ladder, though. So I could go up here, then make my way on this side. But platforming with jumping, and uh, the, the, the jumping feels all right. You obviously have to commit to the jump whenever you get there. I feel like I'm in a never-ending battle, though. This reactor's not going to last much longer. Because I don't have a run button. There's no way to do this faster. All right, so I mean, let me look up that math man and see if that one is going to be coming up. Educational titles are a little harder to come by than the main commercial video games. And so if it's if it's a really obscure educational title, then we may not uh, be on the show, unless you got a copy of it that we can check out. So they're playing a song in the background, but they're playing it slow. Oh, gosh, now we got large. <laughs> the reactor is getting to dangerous levels. And the mice are larger. I don't think I can jump over them. They're doing the sprite stretch trick that was on Atari Systems. So it's the exact same sprites they had before, they just stretched them to make them look like they're bigger. Nice touch. But I made the jump over. 
Yep, platforming's pretty good. Oh, one of the rats came back and got me. Oh, and the computer at school? Yeah, that'll be interesting if we if we check that one out. Oh no, I accidentally dropped the water. So if you push down on the joystick before, you'll drop it. And it looks like I'm moving faster now. Oh, because the reactor went down. The top bar, we blew up. Very psychedelic. <laughs> Everybody's dead. You and your friends are dead. Okay, so it's 1982. This concept is so fresh. P uh, Space Panic is the side view platformer, but there was no jumping in Space Panic. And then Donkey Kong comes in and adds the jumping mechanic. We've seen a few consoles that have done jumping, but as far as computer games doing platforming and jumping, uh, it's rare. So this is a, a very fun time. Cool, cool idea that we have the objective. I don't know if I could call it one of the best games that you could play at the time because um, it is the same re uh, re repeat that you have and it's a little touchy with the joystick controls. Uh, so I'm going to go four stars, still a great title. But as usual, everyone that's here live, go ahead and throw out your five star ratings. If you, if you were here in 1982, what would you give Meltdown? I have never heard of this one. This is another one of those gems that is unearthed that I, I didn't know existed. But uh, Meltdown is a, a definitely above average game, an excellent game for 1982 in May. And a concept we really haven't seen, unless you want to count it's copying Donkey Kong, because it's really not. It's really good. Oh yeah, Mark's going four stars as well. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're here on the Commodore VIC-20, and this is Meteor Maze. Let's see what Meteor Maze is all about, starting with the artwork. This is one that was a type in on Compute Magazine. And so here's the magazine that was part of Volume 4, Issue 5. So the May 1982 issue of Compute. And then this is the article. It is about teaching people how to program with the joystick for the Commodore VIC-20. And they use the example. Here's Meteor Maze. Demonstrates the use of the joystick. Meteor Maze is a fast game using the joystick con connection routine described above. The object is to move your scout ship through the meteor field to the base ship at the bottom of the screen as quickly as possible. Two levels of play are available, novice and advanced. The difference in levels is the computer tolerance for navigational error. And then they explain how they programmed the joysticks to help other people out. Very slick. And that's it. Let's type in and play Meteor Maze by Paul and Steven. Way to go, Paul and Steven. Compute Magazine at the beginning of May 1982. Whoa, it looks like we broke it for a sec there. Meteor Maze. If we're going to use the joystick, I'm very happy. All right, we're in. So here it is. I am controlling in the top left. Why are they blending yellow and white? That's a terrible idea. You can barely see. So as I move the joystick, it's not moving. It's just uh, wiggling in the, the arrow, arrow in the direction. Oh, okay. So if I hold the button down, then, the, then it moves forward. So all the joystick does is move in the direction you want to go. But I got eight-way controls. So I need to make myself... Get from the top left to the bottom right where the dock is. And you can see I'm smashing into... Oh, I need to get there before the time... Oh, the time isn't going down. It's just, I guess, if you get there fast enough, then the time stops. But why? Yellow on white? No. <laughs> There's a lot of Commodore VIC-20 games that do that. All right, we made it. Top of the screen to the top left, down to the bottom right, and there you docked. So it's kind of like a maze game, top down. Done a little bit differently, and the eight-way controls changes up a little bit. But for the most part, uh, Meteor Maze is really, really simple idea. It was a type-in game, so you got to give it good credit for that. Using the joystick as a type-in game is pretty impressive as well. And uh, I'd say for all the computer games we've seen at the time, it's not a bad game. It's uh, it's somewhere around the average range of the usual games we'd see for the time. So I'll still say three stars for Meteor Maze. And the reason why is because, one, the joystick, and two, because it is using the eight-way direction. So you can squeeze through areas as a maze to the other side. So that's cool. Meteor Maze is pretty average for 1982. And with that, let's see what our next game is. We're still on Commodore VIC-20, and this is Meteor Shower. Let's check out Meteor Shower. Another one that has no box, just a few screenshots. Let's pop in and play Meteor Shower by Ron Paladin. Way to go, Ron. Published by UMI in the beginning of May 1982. Meteor Shower. All right, so this one, we'll start with level one. So push number one, and then we're in. 
and it feels like the end of the world already. Hey, joystick control again! So I'm, I'm at the bottom of the screen, I am a fixed gun that can just wiggle left and right. When it's time to fire... Whoa! That's pretty cool. The missile... I'll, I can control that missile. So I am doing that with the joystick, and it feels really responsive for a tile-based game. Whoa! As soon as you fire it off, you can change the way that it is. I'm actually wiggling the joystick left and right and having a good time doing that. And I'm, we're obviously trying to defend the city, so it's kind of like Missile Command, but not. Uh, it's not really a command shooter, because there's no cursor on the screen. It's just one single missile that you direct where it needs to go and get it to hit the asteroids. Anybody else? It's, it's, uh, if you look at the score in the top right, it's just giving me more points for staying alive or keeping my city alive. Looks like we got only meteors that come down and then we have a, a alien UFO, that one that I just blew up that takes us out. So two different enemy types. Number munchers is a big one. We are definitely going to be playing number munchers for sure. Yeah, this is very difficult. It's not as easy as the other command shooters. It's just cool being able to see the missile that you control. Look, I can probably do an S before it blows up. It's just more fun seeing how well you can control the missile going left and right. It's just really fast. All right, so there's Meteor Shower. I'd still say between the games we see on the home computer, it's still around the average range, not doing anything to push uh, higher or lower than that. It is interesting, the, the control of the missile, but not enough really to push it as above average. I'll still say three stars for Meteor Shower. Yeah, Chiptune's with me on three. We're going three. A perfectly average game for 1982. And now let's see what, what our next game is. Still on a Commodore VIC-20, this is Mind Twisters. So we're going to the UK and see what the UK has for us, starting with the box. Mind Twisters, this is by Romic Software. Four games to stretch your brain. Blackjack, Decipher, Forethought, and Teaser. And there's examples of what each game is. We know Blackjack. Decipher is a mastermind variant. Forethought is essentially Connect Four. And then Teaser is a uh, like a match game. So they're all just mind or, or puzzle style games. And none of them are sold separately. They're all three and are all four in this pack. And there's the example of the screenshot. Let's pop it and play on cassette. Mind Twisters. The beginning of May 1982 by Romic Software. Now this one is a brutally long game to load. I'm talking we will be here all day to load. Not this first part. That was pretty quick even on fast forward. But it, back in 1982, you would have waited a long time. I'll, if you want to check out Blackjack, for example, I push number one, and the game is going to be loaded. So this is cassette, and it's impressive that we can go from a title screen on cassette to four different games. That, that's actually really nice for the Commodore VIC-20. But the load times, oh man. I'm a little scared for the load times. How long could you wait for Blackjack? We'll go to the arcade, maybe play some Frogger, and then uh, come back, and then maybe the game's loaded by then. This is one of the worst, because every single one of these games has to be loaded this long to play. All right, let's see if we can fast forward. Uh, no, we can't. See, and if we try to, then the game crashes. It doesn't like that. So I have a cheat sheet in. Instead of just checking out Blackjack, we're going to go and play Forethought, which is one of the ones that's, I would say, one of the best, because it's Connect Four. You have to get four counters in a line, but here's the thing. when Even though we have the game loaded up and we push any key to play, it asks which column we want to drop down, so let's drop on five. And then the computer has to think. Oh, man. Thinking on cassette. No, not graphic intensive. It's just because cassette. A lot of times, the cassette just takes a very long time to load. Look at this. The computer is still thinking about one move. So are you going to wait this long to play Connect 4? We've already played... Oh, Okay, they went. There, they finished their turn. One piece went down on that one. So let's do it again. Let's try 5. Drop it on top. Lands on top. And then the computer has to think again. Yikes. I'm not going to fault it too much because it is 1982. We've seen worse games load than this. And this is four games in one. But because of the load times, I'm, I'm not going to call it bad. I'm going to say it's a, a subpar game. Two and a half stars for Mind Twisters. And the only reason I would say it's two and a half and not a bad game is just because there's four. You have four different games you can play. 
<laughs> Four different games that you can wait a long time to load. So that's Mind Twisters. Gives you an idea of what puzzle games are like from 1982. And with that, let's see what where we're going now. We're back in the UK. Still in the UK. Wait, we, we did not plan this. It went from a Vic 20 UK game to in England again with the BBC Micro. And this is Monsters. Let's take a look at Monsters, starting with the box. Monsters. Very nice. Some of these computer boxes are giving you exactly what the game looks like. That is a picture of the game. No artwork that was drawn. That, that's it. Monsters is it. For the BBC, Microcomputer Model B. Flip it over on the back. Pursued by monsters along the walls and up and down ladders, your only hope of survival is to outwit them by trapping them in holes which you dig in their path. So it's a space panic variant. Quite an exhausting business, so keep an eye on the oxygen level which drops during each screen and eventually runs out whereupon you die. You have three lives, however, and can earn another after scoring 3,000 points. The newest by Acornsoft. Oh yes, before, we, have, we don't know what Load Runner is. I don't know what you're talking about. There is no such thing as Load Runner. There's just Apple Panic, well there's Space Panic and Apple Panic. Let's see what other art we have for monsters. There we go. Monsters just has that, and that's it. Okay, so we're putting in... This is both on a cassette, and then later it was available for disc, disc. Let's pop it and play Monsters. The beginning of May 1982. There we go. Acorn Soft. Oh, it's the same that is described on the back of the box. Monsters can be killed in one of two ways, either by falling through holes which you dig and fill, or by being hit by monsters from above. If a monster is hit by falling monster, both of them die. If you manage to kill all the monsters, you graduate to another screen. Graduate? They've never described it that way, but I'll take it. <laughs> Chiptune, you can see into the future. Wow. The longer you survive, the more you can score as the monsters vary and become more devious. Whereas the red monsters only need to fall through one level, green monsters have to fall through two, white monsters have to fall through three. So that's curious. Apple Panic doesn't have this. They don't have enemies that require multiple levels to fall through. So that's a cool touch. And then any green monsters allowed to crawl out of a hole mutates into a green or white monster. Okay, so <laughs> quite an exhausting business. That's very English. So keep an eye on the oxygen level, which drops during the screen and eventually runs out, whereupon you will die. You got three lives. And what are the controls? Because we're playing on the BBC Micro. Joystick was available later. I don't know if it's available right now in May of 1982. Yeah, there we go. So it's keyboard only. Z, X, up and down, and then dig and fill. These controls are going to be pretty synonymous to the BBC Micro. So look down at your BBC Micro keyboard and you'll know what it's like. Here we go. We're ready to play. Remember the controls, don't forget. Which way to go? Oh, pretty cool. It's fast compared to the other ones. Can we dig? Yep, digging works good. We already got bait. Oh yeah, this plays really, really well. For all the Apple Panic clones that we played. Digging it out, got him, nice. I am also feel like I'm getting lucky because most of the time when you play Space Panic, you gotta wait for the enemies to go, but they're just falling right into the trap. At least the first level was. And we get a song. Ooh, this is a really nice way to play Space Panic at home. We played some pretty good ones on the... Oh. <laughs> okay, well, I, I should have bit my tongue right there. That's right. Space Panic is essentially Hyunkyo Alien turned on its side. It all began with Hyunkyo Alien. <laughs> yep, shouldn't have said the game was too easy. It does control really well. It plays a lot better than some of the other ports we got. All right, we're just going to drop down. Not going to take the heat on that. Let's see if anybody else takes there. Yes, I'll take it. Now we're going to play smarter. Watch our oxygen level. Let's see if we can take this guy out up here. Wow, yeah. Even though it's keyboard control only, this is great. It plays really, really well for a Space Panic game. Let's go. Nice. Oh, it hits him on the head, too, and you get the points. I'll take it. We're only dealing with the red enemies, though. We're still on red, so they haven't hit us with any of the really, really bad, nasty ones. The other thing that makes it easy is, maybe because it's keyboard only, whenever you want to dig, you just hold the button down. And it, it works. There's sometimes we played ports that they didn't respond the first time, and so it was a little frustrating that you couldn't dig when you were expecting it to work. But this time, it feels easy, really, really well. Okay, let's see if we can get over there. Look at them, they're all clumping together, though. Oh, nope, he got out. Quick. Okay. 
Come and take the bait. Uh-oh. So we got a green one. That means he has to fall through two floors at once. Which, in the original Space Panic, you... You did that to get extra points. So you made levels... Oh, he's... Is he... I thought the green one was actually following me around. Alright, if you look back in our history, we played a lot of Space Panic. Hyunkyo Alien turned on its side. And this one is a very good port. I was not expecting this on the BBC Micro. It is a very powerful computer considering the other ones that are out there. And the UK, this is the, 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 the one, if you don't have the budget ZX Spectrum or ZX81, if you were part of a rich family in the UK, this is the computer you would have. This, this costs a lot of pounds, and this shows the kind of games you could play on it. This is pretty good. Yeah, and the colors pop also in the BBC Micro. Yeah. yeah, and the sound effects are great, like an arcade game. So of all the games we've seen at this point, I'm going to rate it like the the, the top one we've seen um, for Space Panic, which is four stars. That is a very good title. Anybody want to throw out some five-star ratings for Monsters, considering I didn't even know Monsters was a Space Panic game. It, it doesn't sound like Apple Panic. And we saw Apple Panic on lots of computers, even though they weren't the Apple computer. But four stars is how we're going to go with Monsters. Yeah, four stars. There's where it's where it's at. <laughs> a billionaire. Yeah, we shelled out all the money to get the BBC Micro. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Oh, here it is. Yes. We made it to the Commodore Max Machine. マックスマシーン。ゲームマシンの冒険者、シンセサイザーのプレイヤー、コンピューターの挑戦者。今、マックスカートリッジで変身する。コンピューターをおもちゃにするのは僕たちだ。フレンドリーコンピューター。マックス
So here we go, everyone. Uh, bone up on all your Max Machine information. This is it. I just wanted to show this off because as we get to games that are in Japanese and we have the manual in Japanese, I still want to show what the manual looks like of what they would have used in Japan. Let's pop in and play the first time we could hear the SID ship with Music Machine, the beginning of May 1982 by Commodore Business Machines. <laughs> this is it. All right, here we go. All this is is a music maker. So all I'm doing is using my keyboard to give you some sweet sounds as like the preview of what we're going to hear when the Commodore 64 comes out later in August. Can I switch things up too? You can do... Sweet. Decay. we have any effects here? Enter. So this is technically not a video game. All this is, is an application that lets you make music. And you can switch things up. Uh, you, you, there's not a whole lot of options, but you, do, you can uh, see different voices and play different voices and then make different sound effects. But you're pretty much just playing with the sound chip because it's very impressive for the time. <laughs> Yes. This is like an auto beat. I pushed one of the auto beat buttons on it. Do we have any other effects we can do? All right, that's all we'll show for Music Machine. We rarely do apps, but there's not really that many games or applications for the Commodore Max Machine. I think it's only 30, somewhere around that ballpark. So for Music Machine, uh, it's really not even a game. So uh, I'm not going to call it broken. But uh, for a vid for video game purposes, I'm only going to go two stars. I wanted to show it here just because it's the first time you get to hear like a preview of the Commodore 64. So cool. But I mean, way underpowered. 2K of RAM? No way. No way. All right, so there's the Commodore Max Machine and Music Machine. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're now on the Sinclair ZX81, and this is Night Driver. That's right, Night Driver. The the Night Driver we saw as 280 Zap or Night Driver for the Atari. We're going to play this on the ZX81. All right, let's see what it's like. We don't have a box for this. I couldn't find anything except a few screenshots, and then we have just two different versions. So let's put the cassette in and play Night Driver by Christoph Zworski. The beginning of May in 1982. This is it. Oh my gosh, we are in playing Night Driver. No sound, because there's no sound on the ZX81. But uh, what you see here is what it is. I didn't have to type anything else to load it up. Once you go in the game, it just goes. It's a freeware title, so there's really no publisher. It's just Kristoff that made this. But wow, it doesn't really feel like I'm driving. It feels, um, it feels like my car is way too big, and I'm just trying to dodge things on the side. So I don't get the feeling of speed or racing playing this. All you do is go left and right, and the the controls are a little weird. You got that chiclet keyboard again. What what did I hit? I didn't see what I hit. But you use Y, U, I, O, and P to move right, and then you use T, R, E, W, Q. Like, all the QWERTY moves left, and then everything else moves right. So it's very bizarre, strange controls, and there's no way to speed up, at least not that I could find, pushing all the buttons. So there you go. We've seen a flight simulator for the ZX81. And now we've seen another first-person driving game for the ZX81. Wow. I don't know what to expect. The ZX81 is a computer that originally was only doing like adventure games, text only. And then look, look how far it's come. Good job, buddy. So that's Night Driver. Of all the home computer games we could play at the time... It's still around the bad range uh, because it's it's not doing what it's supposed to do for a driving game. It's really not uh, super fun or challenging because all you're doing is taking a large object and trying to squeeze it between. It, it feels more like an objective of don't hit the sides, really not, not a racing game. So I'm going to have to go uh, for the attempt. It's, it's pretty cool, but two stars, so it's the best of the bad. Oh, two and a half. Okay. Yeah, there is better games on the platform for sure. Yeah, two and a half would be, you know, subpar. Um, and the controls is also the other thing, too. There's no joystick on this one. So um, 
if this is all you had though in England uh, for the Zig City one, or you had the Timex Sinclair 1000, you can get a little bit of enjoyment out of this one. So there you go, that's Night Driver. And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Here we go on the Commodore VIC-20, this is Nightcrawler. Oh man, this one I barely squeezed in. I found out about this a few weeks ago because there is no artwork. Uh, I found an eBay article of someone that posted they had Nightcrawler, and I go, what's Nightcrawler? And I looked it up, got his screenshots, put them in the show, and then here we are, this is it. So let's take a look at Nightcrawler on the Commodore VIC-20. Nightcrawler. By the front of the box, if we're killing bugs, it's gotta be a centipede variant. This is published by Rabbit Software. We got just a few screenshots, and the first time it was ever reviewed was in the magazine Your Computer, the Britain's best-selling home computer magazine. At least it says here. So the first review I ever heard of was in December 1982, but um, there was uh, other sources in May 1982 for Nightcrawler. And there you go. Whoever it was that posted this on eBay, thanks. Because it shows you instructions, too, when you open up the sleeve of the cassette. Venture into the green forest, but beware of the alien creatures, especially the Nightcrawler. This cassette contains four copies of the program, two on each side. Ensure that the cassette deck is three feet away from the television. Why would it need to be three feet away from the television? <laughs> All right, so let's pop in and play some Nightcrawler on our Commodore VIC-20. This is by Jimmy Huey. Way to go, Jimmy. And he's developed by Interesting Software, published by Rabbit Software. All right, we got our VIC-20 joystick in, and that's pretty slick. You can select your skill level using the VIC-20 joystick. Cool. Okay, we'll do level one. And the button works. Nice. I love the computer games where you have the joystick in and that's all you need. Okay, yeah, and it's Centipede, all right. That must be the Nightcrawler, not the Centipede. That's at the top, the top of the screen. Okay, this is a little weird to say, but the game doesn't look particularly nice, but it plays really well for Centipede. Like, this is a really good game of Centipede. It feels good. I don't know what's happening, though. Wait, what just killed me? What was that? Was that Pac-Man? Yes, th there is Pac-Man that just invaded the game and ran across and killed me. I was just killed by Pac-Man. <laughs> what? Well, now I want to dab it again. I've never never thought of Pac-Man as the enemy. That definitely was Pac-Man, right? Oh, well, that time it was the spider. Yeah, the spider movement is about the same. It is. What in the world? It's Pac-Man. You got to dodge Pac-Man too. So you have the spider that bounces around. Then you have the, I think it was the gnats that flew down from the top of the screen in Centipede. They have those as well. But what really gets me though is the movement. Even though this feels like a tile-based program game, it feels really smooth. I don't know how they're doing that. I feel like I have a lot of control over the, the middle character. And just like in the arcade, you can just hold down the fire button, and then it repeats your shots, which is really nice. Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah, great version of Centipede to play on the VIC-20. Not really the best to look at, so does that mean this didn't attract the ladies? By the way, how did Centipede really get ladies into the arcade when it was about bugs? Girls don't like bugs. So, so why do girls like Centipede? Some game psychologists tell me that one. That's right, the Pac-Man's playing the role of the Scorpion from Centipede. This is why I love the Wild West of video games. We're in 1982, and we've seen games that just go beyond all licensing agreements. It makes no sense. It feels like they can do whatever they want to do and play whatever they want. Look at that. Okay, he's kind of not shaped perfectly like Pac-Man, but I mean, come on, he's yellow. He's got one mouth on the side. It's got to be Pac-Man. So telling, by the way, that I've been playing and staying alive, it, th this is a great version of, of Centipede. <laughs> it's Centipede with Pac-Man. Maybe it'll, it'll attract more women into the to play the game. It's not switching out the colors, though. Every level, it's pretty much all green. And I've been, I think this is level four. The only reason I'm doing so well is just it, it works so well, well with the Commodore VIC-20 joystick. It's really nice. 
Cool sound effects for the explosion, too. So that's Nightcrawler for the Commodore VIC-20. Uh, the gameplay is what really sells it. That's really the, uh, the, the best thing for it. Centipede's still a very new concept. We haven't seen the official port by Atari yet. And um, I'm seeing a trend. We've been doing this for a while on the show, and any game that comes out first in the arcade that's a really popular arcade game, like Centipede, the first time we get any clones or any variants comes on the computer. We get the computer's uh, games out first, and then later the licensed console games show up. We still haven't seen the official Centipede version. So, uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a three and a half from Mark in the chat, and I'm going to say even higher than that just because of the, how well it plays. I'm going to go four stars. It's a really great version of Centipede, uh, and it just plays really well. So lots of fun, and you can tell that um, while it was something that wasn't extremely popular, it's still an excellent game. I dig it. All right, and with that, it's time to put our video game playing on pause. It's May 1982, and if you could go back to this time, how would you rate all the games in our five-star rating system? Let me know in the comments below. And if you're in anywhere in the Dallas, Texas area, uh, this weekend I'll be at the International uh, Vintage Computer Festival. So we'll catch you then. That's it for today, and like I always say, real life doesn't have three lives, so make it count. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9pm Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.